four best problems for each of you, and uh, it was 25 points per. So this is the distribution of the grades. Uh, I wrote a solution The microphone is on, so <laughs> be careful. <laughs> Whatever you say. at the solution because these are problems that you know you'll uh, you'll see again in the final in two weeks uh, for review for the final have a look at the two tests at the two reviews and we haven't done much beyond that uh, where there are a couple of sections one we're going to do the homework about today uh, the converge convergence on on in measure section, and the other one is the Fubini tonality theorems that I'm going to assign uh, homework today, and we'll go over them next week. Okay, so besides that, which is you know, a little bit, uh, the, the main, the bulk of the material is up to this uh, test. So it's really important that you understand your mistakes. Um, I'm going to, uh, let's see, yeah, I wanted. I wanted to do number three because you had problems with number three. Uh, most of you did. And uh, it's an important problem. So let's have a look at this. So we know that G is integrable. Which means that uh, G is finite almost everywhere. Okay, this implies that. And uh, by the way, about this uh, infinity uh, concept, uh, some of you are still confused. Uh, a measurable function does not need to be finite. Okay, you have perfectly fine measurable functions that are infinite on some non-trivial set. That's fine. That's not forbidden. Okay, you seem to, to think that that's not true. The monotone convergence theorem does not, the only hypothesis that you need is positive and measurable. You don't need your function to be integrable or finite or anything like that. Okay, that's the beauty of it. Okay, the whole theory is based on this type of idea that if you have something positive and measurable, then you can do things. You can do computations. So coming back to this thing, well, what we can do is uh, call the null set, the set of x's, so that g of x is infinite. So we know that n is a null set. So what we do is we take x not belonging to n, which is almost every x, 
and we see that there exists an M such that G of X is less than N. Okay, by the Archimedean property. So when we look at, uh, we're looking at this. Yeah, when we look at G of X, times 1 g of x bigger than and not what we have is a finite number okay because x does not belong to n times something which is zero okay or in what we can say is that uh, uh, of course g of x is going to be small for every uh, n less than n naught. So for n, every n bigger than n naught. Therefore, this thing goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, because after n naught, this is zero. And you are multiplying zero by a finite number. You don't have any problem computing the limit here. So for every x not in your null set, you have a limit. Which means that g1, g bigger than n converges to 0 almost everywhere. Okay? So that's the first step. Second step, you look at g1, g bigger than n, and you say this is less than g. Because an indicator is less than 1. And this, by assumption, is integral. So the dominated convergence theorem tells you that you can't put your limit inside your integral. Okay? The limit as n goes to infinity of the integral of g, g bigger than n is, by the dominated convergence theorem, the integral of 0, which is 0. And you're done. Okay, this is a typical problem where you need to find the dominating function. You need to think about what it means to have a property almost everywhere. And you apply the dominated convergence theorem. That's, uh, okay, if you know how to do this problem, you have a B already in this class. Okay, it's really, it has all the ingredients you need to understand. So have a look at what you did. Have a look at my solution. Come ask me questions if you have any, and you should have some. And okay, you so that you can prepare for a final. So don't get discouraged if your grades are not as high as you had hoped. Uh, they still hope uh, the final supersedes everything if it's better than the average. So So now let's go over the homework which is due today. So 33 was tougher than I thought. 
I had reversed an inequality because I, I do have a problem before signing it, but uh, uh, so my solution was wrong. And I apologize to those of you I emailed to because I pointed you towards uh, the wrong direction. So, uh, but you always learn from mistakes, so I don't feel that bad. However, uh, so let's let's see how uh, how to do this. So we we want a fat two lemma. But we only have convergence in measure instead of convergence almost everywhere. That's the issue. So what I did, uh, you have several things to use in this thing, which is, so this is 33. So let's call AN the sequence of uh, intervals. And a n is well defined. It could be infinity, uh, but besides that, it's a well defined number. Now, what I'm going to f first fact that we have seen is that if uh, uh, that there exists a subsequence n k such that a n k converges to lim inf of a n. Okay, all I'm saying is that the limit of any sequence is actually the limit of a subsequence. It's actually the definition of lim inf. One, one characterization of lim inf is that the lim inf is the smallest possible limit you can get. Okay, uh, that's, that's how you can think of that. So first fact, you, we have this. And that's what we are going to use here. So we have that. Uh, there is a subsequence f and k that converges to my lim inf of f n as k goes to infinity. So this gives me a subsequence of functions f and k. Now, a second fact. Is that if f n converges to f in measure, then f and k converges to f in measure as well. OK? So there's nothing really. Uh, that's surprising. We know that if a sequence converges to A, then any subsequence is going to converge to the same limit. Except that here we are talking about convergence in measure, so we should be careful because it's a different type of convergence. Okay, it's not a known fact. Well, but it's very easy to check because uh, what you do is you look at. Uh, you look at your, so you're looking at the measure mu, and you're looking at uh, uh, something like this. Okay, you take your, an epsilon, and you look at uh, the measure of this set, and then you say, well, but this thing here is a real, so I don't know, you could call this thing B and K, is a subsequence. of Bn. Okay, where well, Bn, you can imagine what it is. It's this thing here. But now we are in business because this is a subsequence of reals. Okay, now we have a sequence of reals, a subsequence of reals. We know that this sequence goes to zero because that's the definition of what fn converges to measure is. Therefore, the subsequence converges to 0 as well. OK? So that proves it. That's all we need. OK, third ingredient. There exists a sub subsequence such that f of n k j converges to f almost everywhere. 
Okay, that's uh, the main theorem of this section. If you have convergence in measure, well, you have convergence along a subsequence. Okay. And now we can uh, prove what we want, finally, by simply using FATU on this thing. Okay, so we write FATU, we say that lim inf on j of, uh, what do we want? The integral of lim inf of f and k j is less than lim inf of on j of the integral f and k j. Now this thing is f. That's how we have manufactured our subsequence. So we get f less than. And this thing here, what's this thing? Well, let's see. Remember that uh, our fnk converges to the lim inf. So if you take the integrals of fnkj, you have a subsequence of this guy that also is going to converge to this. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that because we have a n converging to the lim inf of the integral, we have that any subsequent sub subsequence it's going to converge to the same thing. Okay? So this thing here is exactly what I need. And so we're done. So you, you need to take a detour because uh, the inequality I had in mind is wrong. Uh, it's well, what the inequality you have is that the lim inf of a n is less than the lim inf of a n k. You take less terms, you get something which is smaller than. That's easy to prove, but that's not the, the, the direction you want. You want the, the other inequality. If, this, if the reverse inequality were true, it's a two lines proof, and that's what I thought. I finally got to my senses this morning. Okay, questions? So that was a harder one. We, without any indication like that, that was a little hard. I mean, you need, you need several steps and it wasn't. Now, 34 is easy if you use 33. Because, so 34, what you do? The way to prove a dominated convergence theorem is to use FATU twice. And that's exactly what you need to do here. It's exactly the same proof. Okay? Because you, you, you have a dominating function, therefore g plus fn is positive and measurable. And then you do your, uh, and okay, so the other thing you need here is that g plus fn converges to g plus f in measure. That's a triviality, okay? Because when you do mu of the difference, you get fn minus f. And therefore, this thing goes to zero. And there is really nothing here. OK? So you have these two things here. You use exercise 33. You know that the inf of g plus fn 
no, that's uh, g plus f. That's how we. Is less than lim inf of g plus fn. But the lim inf of this sum is this, is this constant plus the lim inf. Okay, so. So you get that G plus F is less than G plus lim inf of the Fn. So you end up with, so you know that your G is integrable, and this is a crucial point because you don't want to subtract infinity on both sides. But that you know, so you can do that, and you end up with this. That's the only point where you're using the integrability of G. Okay, otherwise you're not using it. Okay, because fat 2 or, or this version of fat 2 is true anyways. But if you don't know integrability, then you cannot subtract both terms. This thing cannot be put on this side. You cannot cancel the integrals of G. And it doesn't work. Okay, so that's, that's where you use it. Now, you do the reverse thing too. You use that uh, G minus Fn is also positive. And you redo exactly the same lemma the same lemma you use here, and you end up this time with integral of f less than lim sub of the integral of fn. We did it. Just look at your notes. The reason you get a lim sub this time is because minus lim inf is lim sub. Let me write it. Well, except that this time it's this, the, the, the thing where I should do it. Okay, so let's do it. We have same same thing as before. We can have we can write that g minus f n converges to g minus f in measure. We use thirty three, and we get that g minus f is less than uh, lim inf of G minus Fn, and then we have G minus F less than G plus lim inf of minus of Fn. Same as before, it cancels. Now this thing here is minus lim sub of fn. And this is minus f. And so you get the promised inequality, which is this thing here. So now you are done because uh, the lim, from here you get that the lim sub is less than the lim inf. See? But your lim sub must be less than your lim inf, therefore they are equal. And if they are equal, they, are, they must be equal to the integral of f. Therefore you have convergence and it's equal to. So it's really interesting in the sense that uh, it's fat, fat 2 implies the dominated convergence theorem. That's what it is. Okay, so we redid the proof of it. OK, 
So we are told that Fn converges to F in measure and we want to show that this implies uh, the inequality. Okay. So so for this direction take an epsilon. Then define A n to be mu of fn minus f bigger than epsilon. Then you know that an converges to zero. That's the definition of convergence in measure, which means that we exist an n so that an minus zero is less than epsilon for n larger than capital N. Therefore, an is less than epsilon, which is what we wanted. The converse is as easy, isn't it? Because what you want is to show now that this thing goes to zero. So this time, what do we have? That this thing here is less than epsilon. So we know that for every epsilon, we exist an n, so that mu of fn minus f larger than epsilon is less than epsilon. And from this, we need to show that uh, we this must converge to zero. Okay. Um, you see, the only thing which is a little uh, awkward is to use the same epsilon. But that's the only problem. So what you can do several things. You can either do a proof by contradiction where maybe that's the best. So by contradiction, assume that Fn does not converge in measure to F. which means that there exists an epsilon so that mu of fn minus f larger than epsilon does not converge to zero, which means, so, so for a positive sequence not to converge to zero means that you need to find a subsequence which is bounded away from zero. That's the only way. Okay, so there must exist an A mm. 
right. Uh, and the subsequence nk, so that mu of f and k minus f uh, bigger than epsilon is bigger than a for all k. Okay, that's the only way. If if your sequence is not going to zero, then it means that along a subsequence you are away from zero. If not, then you would be converging to zero. So if this is true, then uh, what uh, what you can do is simply say, well, let's take b, let b be the minimum. Uh, of A and Epsilon. And we would have that mu of F and K minus F bigger than B. So I'm bigger than B, and B is smaller than epsilon. So this means that it's easier to be bigger than B than epsilon. So this means that my inequality goes this way. This is larger than mu of f and k minus f uh, bigger than epsilon. And this, we say, is bigger than A. which is, and A is bigger than B. Okay, so we end up with mu of f and k minus f bigger than B, bigger than B for every n k. That contradicts what we have here. Because we claim that whatever we put here, we can go below it if we look far enough. Well, this, this doesn't happen for this one. We are always above B. So that's a contradiction. Maybe there is a, a quicker way to do it. OK. Did I assign 38A uh, as well? Okay. Okay. So we know that Fn and Gn converge to F and G respectively in measure. And we want to show that the sum converges. Well, the, the only thing to do here is the following. Epsilon, where I claim that this is less than, this is included in Fn minus F, bigger than Epsilon over 2, union of Gn minus G bigger than Epsilon over 2. Why is this true? Well, If uh, yeah, maybe the other. If f n of x minus f of x is less than or equal to epsilon over two, and g n of x minus g of x is less than or equal to epsilon over two, then the sum. Then when we do uh, fn of x plus uh, gn of x minus f of x minus g of x, this is less by the triangular inequality 
then f of x minus f of x plus g n of x minus g of x. And this is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is epsilon. So if I take an x in the complement of this union, it means that I have smaller than epsilon over 2 and smaller than epsilon over 2 here. Then um, in the complement of this guy, because this is less than epsilon, therefore it proves that I'm correct. Okay, what I'm saying here is that if uh, I can prove that complement of A is included in complement of B, this is the same as proving that B is included in A. Okay, so that's what I did here. I took an X in this complement, and I have shown that it was then in this complement. So this is correct. Now, when I'm going to take my mu on both sides, I'm going to have less than the sum, because we know that mu of the union is less than the sum of the two sets. And we know that this goes to zero and this goes to zero. And so we squeeze our term here in the middle between zero and things going to zero, therefore it must go to zero as well. Okay? So Fn plus Gn converges in measure to F plus G. So that's it for the homework, right? So uh, for next week, I'd like you to uh, do the following problems. I won't collect them because it will be the last day of class, but uh, try to do them. So this is, uh, these are a few problems on Fubini and Tonelli theorems. So assume that f is positive and uh, that mu, so what do I need here? Well, let's assume also that mu is a finite measure. Then show that
So M as O is this Volebeck measure. So you integrate this thing over all x's, show that this is actually the same as f d mu. Define capital F as being mu of minus infinity x. And again, assume that mu is a finite measure. Then show that the integral of, so take c a positive number, and then look at the integral of f of x plus c minus f of x. and integrate this with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Show that this is actually C times mu of R. Give a condition on A and K that allow the following. Okay, so find a condition on A and K that allows you to do that and give an example. And a counterexample. Questions? Okay, so in each of these problems, use Fubini or tonality theorems, or both. I'd like to talk about uh, uh, uniform integrability uh, because of the following. So, so far, we, the, the main terms we have looked at are terms of a type if fn converges to f, then the integral of fn converges to the integral of f. Okay, that's the type of uh, thing we have been concerned in this class. What we have found are sufficient conditions to do that, okay? You may have the monotone convergence theorem or the dominated convergence theorem. These are the two things we have seen. Now, sometimes your sequence is not monotone, and sometimes you don't find a dominating function. What do you do then? It would be nice to have a necessary condition as well. And that's what uniform integrability is going to give us, okay? So it will tell us where if this condition is true, uh, well, so, so I'll state the theorem is, uh, assume that fn goes to f almost everywhere. 
then you can pass to the limit if and only if this condition holds. And the condition is uniform integrability. So let's define this. Fn is said to be uniformly integrable if uh, you have that the supremum okay. yeah. if you do the supremum of the integral fn fn larger than m if this uh, supremum over all n converges to zero as m converges to infinity. Okay, so you look at your integrals over this fn bigger than m. You take the supremum of all of these guys and then you take the limit. The order is very important. Usually you cannot invert that. If this is true, then your sequence is uniformly integrable. The uniform comes from the idea that it's the same m that you use. And this is uh, a, actually, if you, if you think about it, this is what uh, the problem three that I talked to you about, that I gave you the solution, was it three? Yes, that's, that's what uh, problem three tells you in the test. So if you look at problem three, you are told that uh, G, that this thing goes to zero. Okay, as n goes to infinity. If your G is integrable. Right, that's what we prove. Now what's remarkable about uniform integral is that it still goes to zero if you take all of your sequence and you look at the biggest one of these guys. Okay, you may very well have that each individual goes to zero, but when you take the supreme of them, then they don't anymore. Okay, because the speed at which they are going to zero is not the same. So we are going to see examples. Okay. Okay. So uh, that's that's nice. However, to to prove this uh, by hand is uh, probably a nightmare in most cases. I mean, how we are, go are we going to actually do the computation? Uh, very rarely it's going to be possible to do a computation directly. Don't worry. We have a good criterion which is a form, well, uh, let's first do an example. Assume that the supremum over all n of fn square is finite. Okay, you take all your functions, you square them and you look at the supreme of your integrals and you find a finite number. Then Fn, the sequence Fn is uniformly integral. How do we prove that? Well, we, we need to work with this thing there. And we need to introduce a square because that's what we have. So 
So, okay, let's multiply and divide by absolute value of Fn. And we get this. Now, uh, if, of course, if Fn is bigger than M, it means that 1 over Fn is less than 1 over M. Therefore, we say, well, this is less than fn bigger than m, fn square, 1 over m, which is 1 over m, this thing here, fn square. But I'm integrating a positive function. So if I get rid of this condition, I get something bigger, okay? because I have the whole space to integrate over. So this is less than 1 over m integral of fn squared. And then this is less than 1 over m, the supremum over o n of the integral of fn squared. But this thing we say is finite. Okay? So let's see. So at this point, what do we have? Let's call this guy k. It's a number. Okay, we're assuming it's. Uh, and so we have this inequality for every n and every m. So we first take the supreme over all n's. And then we have at the supreme squeeze between 0 and k over m. This goes to 0 as m goes to infinity, and this goes to 0 as m goes to infinity. Therefore, we get that our term here goes to 0, and we have that our sequence is uniform integrable. is not that special in this problem at least. Sometimes it is. What, what kind of power could I have used instead of putting a square here and do the same thing essentially? I'm sorry? Even. Evens. Well, you see, the only thing I need, really, is some room here to get something that's going to zero. So my power needs to be strictly bigger than one, that's all. Because if I have anything here, like one plus p, I'm going to end up with, uh, with what? Uh, well, I'm going to divide by fn, I'm going to end up with 1 over m, and I'll be fine. But if my power is exactly 1, it doesn't work. I cannot do that. OK? Uh, well, we can redo it for, for general power. Uh, let me show you that it doesn't work if we have just the power 1. Okay. 
So let's let's find a counterexample. Where are we here? So assume that the supremum of the integrals is finite, then the sequence Fn is not necessarily uniform integrable. And what's going to work is that counterexample that we have here. Yeah, this thing here. Yeah. So if Fn is 1 over n, so define Fn to be 1 over n indicator of 0 n. The integral of Fn with respect to the Lebesgue measure is 1. And this is a positive function, so it doesn't matter. I can put absolute values if I want. So I do have that the supremum in this case is 1. Okay, it's a constant sequence. Now, why is it uniform integrable? Well, let's look. So we look at fn, fn bigger than m, uh, dm. And because we are going to let m go to infinity, let's take m bigger than 1 to start. Well, Now, this is not a good example. Because this is, Fn is always less than m. So this thing is always going to be uh, 0. OK, the indicator is always 0. So there is nothing here. And uh, therefore, our supremum is going to be 0, and uh, the whole thing goes to 0. So that's not a good example. Uh, what I need to do um, what I need to do is actually work with a finite measure space. Because that's that's one condition. Yeah, I should uh, I, sh I should think about it and uh, and uh, give you a counterexample next time. Because Sorry about that. So I'll come back to this and uh, and give you a counterexample next time. Now let's uh, do a more general condition, which is going to be. So now let's assume.
that for some p, we have at the supremum over on of fn of 1 plus p is finite. So we assume a little more than that thing there. And actually, we can even assume more than that, but I, I don't. Uh, we may talk about it afterwards, but let's assume this for the time being. Then I claim that Fn is uniform integral. And the proof is almost identical to what we just did. We look at the integral Fn, Fn bigger than m. And we say that this is Fn of 1 plus p over Fn of p for Fn bigger than m. OK, so we're multiplying and dividing by Fn to the p. Then this is less than 1 over m to the p times fn to the power 1 plus p. And this thing has a supremum. That doesn't depend on n, of course. So this is less than, so let's call this supremum here, let's call it k of p. So we get k of p over m to the p. OK, so that's what our bound is. And you see, the point is that I got rid of my ends. And that this goes to 0 as m goes to infinity. So any p positive will work. p equals 0 will not. Yes? No, because I'm working with positive numbers. Oh, if I didn't want the absolute value. No, uh, y right. If I didn't want the absolute value, then I, 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 would need, I, I would need an even power, yes. OK. So uh, let's take a, a break, 10 minutes, and then we'll go back to this. So actually, the variance of uh, y, of a vector y, is equal to the variance of a vector e. Because the, the difference between y's and e's is just constant. Okay, you are adding constants to your different y. You're not changing the, cor the correlations or the variances. And what is variance of E? Well, the variance of E1 is sigma square, of E2 is sigma square, and so on. So they are all sigma square in my diagonal. And what do I have outside the diagonal? Zero. See, it's a diagonal matrix. So it's a sigma square i. That's what we get for variance of y. What else do we need? Uh, we need the expected value of y. The expected value of y is this thing. Well, now we, we should use the matrix again. Uh, y is beta x. No, x beta. plus e. So expected value of y is x beta. Right? Because expected value of e is. So now we are ready to do this. First thing, uh, we need i minus p 
times variance of y. So that's i minus p sigma square i, which is simply sigma square i minus p. Okay. Now we need trace of sigma square i minus p. So let's think about this. Uh, I have a matrix. I'm multiplying the matrix by the constant sigma square. And I'm adding the diagonal. The, the, I'm, I'm summing up the diagonal. So the constant can be pulled out. Then I need to compute trace of a difference of two matrices. Can I say that it's uh, the difference of the traces? Yeah. It's a, it's a linear operator, so it's sigma square trace of i minus trace of p. Now we need to compute trace of p. Trace, well, one other property, and this one is non-trivial, is that trace of AB is actually trace of BA. If you commute your product, you still get the same trace. Now, a trace of P is trace of so P is X x prime x minus 1 x prime which according to uh, so let's think of this guy uh, as one matrix and this one as the other matrix so according to what I just wrote I can say that this is trace of x prime x x prime x minus 1 and what is x prime x, x prime x minus 1? Yeah. It's an identity. But we should have been more careful with our identities. These are p by p matrices. So this is an identity p by p. Okay, the other identity I had here, uh, hmm. Yeah, this identity here is an n by n identity. Why? Well, I'm doing the variance of an n vector. So I have n by n terms. Okay, so it's not the same. Trace of IP is P. That's, that's why it's important. It's not n. So we end up with our trace of P. Okay, so... Uh, Right, so this is what we were computing here. And we can conclude that trace of sigma square i minus p is sigma square. So this was uh, yeah, this is n. No, okay, no. This is uh, okay. I got lost somewhere. Uh, this must be I uh, must be I P. Otherwise, I can't subtract my two matrices. They need to have the same dimension. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't make sense to to subtract them. Oh, okay. The problem is here. When I do AB, I may have a certain dimension. When I do BA, I may have a different dimension. And that's what's confusing. So let's uh, think about this thing for a minute. What's the dimension of P? Uh, 
P is, let's rewrite P, and we're going to find out what the dimension of P is. The dimension of P? Uh, let's see uh, what it is. X prime, X minus 1, X prime. That's what P is. So, I know that this guy is n times p. I know that this is a p by p matrix. And I know that this is a p by n matrix. So now, when I multiply these two, I get n by p times p by n. And I end up with n by n. So my matrix p is an n by n matrix. And this is i n. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. OK. So when I'm doing uh, the trace, the, so I should write here, I n, I n, I n. And when I'm doing this computation, I do get sigma square, trace of I n, which is n, minus trace of p, what we just showed to be p. So we get sigma square n minus p for the trace. Now, the last thing to do is look at So the, the other part in, in the computation is the part that involves mu, uh, the expected value. And this part turns out to be 0. So let's see if we can see this. So the other part we need to do is expected. Uh, so what we are doing here, just let me rephrase this. Yeah, the, the expected value of y prime i minus p y, we say, that according to our lemma, is expected value of y prime i minus p expected value of y plus sigma square uh, n minus p, which is the thing we just computed here. So what's, the only thing which is missing is this part here. And this part is supposed to be 0. Let's see why. Expected value of y, we said, was x beta. So we have this guy is x beta. Then we do i minus p. And p is x, x prime x minus 1, x prime. And then we have, so this is x beta prime. And then we have x beta again. And this is x beta prime minus, uh, well, maybe I should just inverse this too. So we get beta prime x prime minus beta prime x prime x, x prime x minus 1 x prime. So I multiplied this guy by the inside here. And now I need to multiply from the right 2, which gives me beta prime x prime x beta minus beta prime x prime x x prime x minus 1, x beta. No, x. Uh, is this a prime? Yeah, that's good. It's a prime x beta. Well, what happens? This is the identity. And this is the same as that. What? Oh, 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 yeah. This is prime, prime. 
So you see that you get beta prime x prime x beta minus beta prime x prime x beta, which is indeed 0. OK, so conclusion, our uh, sum of yi minus y hat square, the expected value of this guy is sigma square n minus p, which tells me that an estimator for sigma is 1 over n minus p sum of yi minus yi hat squared. Okay, so we finally achieved our objective, which was to find an estimate of a sigma. Of course, you could have told me that without doing the computations. Questions? So let's stop here for today.